Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Arch Community College. This is Digital Electronics 1. This lecture is entitled Instrumentation is Applied to Digital Electronics. So the instrumentation that we're going to be using for digital electronics, you should be incredibly familiar with already. It's the exact same stuff we've already used. We're just going to be using it in them in ever so slightly different ways. Uh, first up is our oscilloscope. So I have been using the heck out of timing diagrams. There is no such thing as a timing diagram maker. Okay, and when you walk in the lab, you're going to be like, "Hey, where's the timing diagram maker?" It don't do that. It's the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is the thing that displays the voltage output. Okay, if you guys remember right, hopefully it is slightly more powerful than that monstrosity on that guy's desk. If you remember right, an oscilloscope has a screen on it divided into blocks five blocks this way standard oscilloscope screen oscilloscope screens five blocks that way four blocks up four blocks down the uh, left and right blocks the horizontal blocks those are our time okay the time divisions ones twos fives and tens okay you can set that with your time sensitivity, and I'm just doing this for a generic oscilloscope. I'm not going to do it for every single sing single type of oscilloscope we've got. They're typically in multiples of one, twos, fives, and tens. When you place something on an oscilloscope screen, let's say you've got an output digital data waveform that has that you want to see what the output is, what the duty cycle is, what the period and the frequency is, you're just going to put it on the oscilloscope. And the time divisions. Uh, like I said, it's multiples of 1, 2, 5, and 10. Let's pretend it is 1 volt, excuse me, 1 millisecond per division. I've got it set up right there. Okay, 1 millisecond per division. I've got 5 divisions, and I know I'm not exactly accurate there. So if I've got 5 divisions there, each is 1 millisecond. What I want to know is what the frequency is, what the period is, what the duty cycle is, all those things that we discussed in one of our earlier lectures. If you can imagine, I know I'm not particularly accurate here in this, it looks to me like the period is from there to there. It repeats itself every one and a half divisions. If each division is one millisecond per division, what is my time period? It's 1.5 milliseconds. What is my pulse width? My pulse width appears to be one full division, one millisecond. And additionally, I can adjust those waves as to left and right. So if it's not on a division, I can move that waveform back and forth to get easier measurement. And for the sake of completeness, what is the frequency? Frequency is one over T. 6, 6, 6, point 0.7 hertz. That's your timing diagram. Your oscilloscope is making your timing diagram. One thing, too, is vertical sensitivity. If our TTL outputs go from 0, notice I'm not saying it's 0 centered. It goes from 0 up to 5 volts. We'll come back to this when we get to the function generator. 0 to 5 volts. What is my vertical sensitivity? You know, if you just want it one block high, just make your vertical sensitivity 5 volts per division. It'll be one block high. Additionally, I can place channel 1's 0 right here, channel 1. I can place channel 2's using the vertical placement knobs there. And so I can get channel 2's digital signal. If I want a channel 3, and I, we have uh, four channel oscopes upstairs, I can put that one zero there, and I can see the timing relationship with each other. Voila, a timing diagram. So the oscilloscope makes the timing diagram. While we're at it, let's go to the function generator. Like I said, TTL, compatible waveforms, and I guarantee someone's going to do this. They're going to say, okay, square wave it. They're going to go to the function generator and make a 5 volt peak to peak square wave, which you think would work. Nope. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's two graphs. You go ahead, your first impulse is to create a five volt peak to peak square wave with such and such frequency. Let's say it's 100 hertz. 
what that thing is going to produce. The function generator will produce a 5 volt peak to peak, peaking at 2.5 volts, valleying at negative 2.5 volts. So waveform is going to look like this. Ain't it going to work? Is 2.5 volts clearly a high? No. Is negative 2 volts clearly a low? Yeah, well, it's a lot past it, but it's not. It's, don't do it. You're going to have to create this same waveform. 5 volt peak to peak square wave, frequency 100 hertz, with an offset of plus 2.5 volts. What does that do? It takes the same wave and shifts it up 2.5 volts. What you get is your 5 volt to 0 volt waveform. Additionally, you can kind of shortcut that. There is a TTL compatible output on those function generators, which produces a 0, 2, 1 from 0 waveform. All you got to do is vary the, uh, the frequency. Additionally, there's this thing, uh, not just the square wave. There's this thing called a pulse waveform. So square, pulse, that's how you can vary duty cycle. So there's a duty cycle. Not only is there a period and frequency adjustment, there's also a duty cycle adjustment. Okay, so we're going to be doing that in lab using the function generator to generate square waves with 50% duty cycle, a TTL compatible square waves, excuse me, because it's got that offset. Guarantee someone's going to do it. And you have to have that offset in there uh, because you're going from 0 to 5, not negative 2.5 to 2.5. So that is the function generator. And those things, there is a TTL compatible output, and then there's a straight output. Okay, logic analyzer. What is a logic analyzer? It's a super oscope. It's an oscope with a bunch of channels. We don't have a logic analyzer. We don't need a logic analyzer because when we work with a lot of bits there, we're actually going to be using uh, iSim, which is the uh, FPGA simulation tool. What it is, what a logic analyzer is, it's an oscilloscope with a lot of channels. So you can see. 32 bits, 16 bits, 8 bits, 4 bits, all in relation to each other. And additionally, that does have some added functionality. It will output the state of a particular output. It will tell you 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, whatever it is. The logic probe and the logic pulser and the DMM. How do I know that my output for a particular gate is high or low? You can just use your DMM. Okay, for example. Here is an OR gate, here is an AND gate, here is a NOT gate. I apply a 1 there, a 0 there, and a 1 there, and a 1 there, and a 0 there. Which of these gates will have 5 volts on its output? Okay, again, think to your truth tables. Input of a NOT gate is a 1. It inverts it to a 0. 0 ANDed with a 1 is a 0. One ORed with a one, excuse me, one ORed with a zero is a one. So the answer is, is this one will have five volts on its output. Your DMM is your logic probe. All you do is take the black lead, put it in reference to ground, your red lead, put it on the output of whatever circuit you're trying to test. And that thing is going to say five volts, or it's going to say zero volts. Zero volts obviously is zero, five volts obviously a one. There is the DMM. That's that's your logic probe. There are our commercially available logic probe, which I actually really like using. The reason why I like the logic probes, the commercially available logic probes, is they're tiny. The DMM to me seems uh, slightly obtrusive. All I want to know if it's a one or a zero. I don't care what the actual voltage is. I don't care if it's 4.93 volts. I just want to know if it's a zero or a one. There are commercially available logic probes which you guys are more than welcome to use. It's a little tiny probe. You gotta power it up, plus five volts on one side, ground on the other. You do have to power it up. You can power it from your protoboard. It's got a really, really sharp needle on it. What do you use for that really sharp needle on your lab partner when he's messing something up? There is two LEDs on it, and one says high, and one says low. If the high one's lit, the thing you're touching is high. If the low one's lit, the thing you're touching with is low. Okay, so a commercially available logic probe. I like using them because they're tiny. Pulsar, a logic pulsar. Whereas a probe detects voltage, a pulsar will provide voltage. It's almost like a mini function generator. The logic pulsar is used to detect 
okay, is this input going anywhere? Where is it going to? So it almost even looks like a probe. All you do is you hook it to the thing, to the, uh, the lead in question or the input in question, and it provides a little TTL compatible waveform of whatever frequency you set it out. So pulser provides, probe detects. Just handy little test equipment. DC power supply, you should definitely know this one. Where do we use the DC power supplies? Anytime we provide, anytime we use a circuit, there's always those VCC pins and ground pins, plus five volts and ground. Remember, TTL is a very, very narrow tolerance for input power. It's either 5.25 volts down to 4.75 volts, five volts. On some of the benchtop power supplies, there actually is a separate jack for five volts DC. Just go ahead and use that. That way you don't have to mess around with any knobs. Think okay, we took oscope, logic analyzer, probe, pulser, power supply, function generator, DMM, protoboard. Okay, we already went over LED sourcing and syncing in the previous lecture. Protoboards. Number one error, protoboards. People just go insane. They forget everything I've taught them in electronics one, two, and three. How does a protoboard work? And more importantly than how to how does a protoboard work? How do I efficiently use this to accomplish the, the tasks I'm being asked in lab? Vertical runners, horizontal runners, jacks, rows, valley, row, row, column of rows, excuse me, and one more set of vertical runners. It's a lot more than black and white. Those runners are colored reds. I can't remember where that last one went. Let's just simplify this diagram here. Additionally, some are colored blue. Half the work's done for you guys. What do you need everywhere? You need plus five volts. What else do you need? You need ground. Use it. Take the jack from the five volts from the power supply, put it to the jack, take a wire to the red, to the red, to the red, to the red. Every single vertical runner has got five volts on it. You need ground. Put it to the jack from the power supply, from the Jack, go to the, the horizontal runner, go to every single vertical runner. You've got ground everywhere. Don't do this. Don't hook positive to negative with nothing in between. Don't do it. What does that do for you? It's providing power wherever on the board. You don't have to have this wire snaking everywhere. I can just go ahead and take my dip chip, put it in one side of the column, put them in rows inside one of the, one column, Put the other legs inside rows inside another column. Take VCC from there. Take ground from there. I don't have to have this wire snaking all around here and getting in the way of everything. Uh, speaking of that, don't take wires. Put them over your chip. Bad practice because what happens if that chip is bad or the wrong one? You've got to unwire everything. Keep your wires neat. Run them out and away. Don't use the same color label them if you have to use the same color. It's just some common lab, pra lab practices to start thinking about these things now. Organize, have your schematic, your part here with your schematics, have your lab partner check off, yes, he's done that one, light blue, yes, he's done that one, orange, so on and so forth. Check these things off. Having those switches, these inputs. This is the other thing, if this is your in and that is your out functions, or this is chip A and B, and they're supposed to do something together, and it's not doing that something together, here's what I would do. Figure out if A is doing what it's supposed to. If A is doing what it's supposed to, don't troubleshoot it. B is the problem. Oh, what I'm saying is divide your schematics up to, into functionality. How can I do that? How can I test certain subsystems? Make sure the outs for A are available. So if I'm giving a known condition on my ins, I should get the outs there. And obviously, later on down the line, if I'm getting the wrong outs on A, it's going to mess up the whole program or the whole, uh, whole system. So what I'm saying is divide it into smaller subsections. Just a brief note on protoboard management and some of the wire management. You will get used to this. You will develop practices that work for you and not for others. Be creative, be flexible about these things. And again, most of all, like I've said a hundred times, stay organized.